Hello family, Kit Cummings, Power and Peace Project. Thank you so much for tuning in to talk about something that's a little bit edgy, a little bit controversial in today's society that we're going through. I'm coming to you from Atlanta, Georgia, and this past weekend, this whole thing came to Atlanta. And Atlanta, the, the hub of the civil rights movement now is at the center of this controversy again. And so I wanted to speak about something that a lot of people are talking about. And today I want to realize and remember that everybody is coming at this thing from a different perspective. We're all looking at it through different eyeballs. We all have different brains that have been programmed through our experiences and the people we were raised by modeling, nurture, nature, now, we've all got so many experiences that make up this thing we call life, and we see things the way we see things. We've heard the stories that we've heard. We've told stories, and stories create our world. You tell a story long enough, it becomes a belief, and we're driven by our beliefs. Today, I'm going to share my perspective. I'm going to share my experience. I'm going to share my opinions, and that's what they are. Today, I'm not trying to to adopt a different position. I'm not trying to win you over. I'm definitely not trying to tell you you're wrong and believe what I believe. I'm just offering one man's perspective. Today I want to talk about white privilege in America. Coming from a brother of less color, <laughs> I grew up on the conservative right from Republican family. I grew up here in the South. I've been here around Atlanta for 56 years. I feel like this is my town. I come from a really good family, raised me with good principles. The town I grew up in, everybody looked like me. The school that I went to, everybody looked like me. I was afforded a wonderful education. Out of high school, it wasn't if I was gonna go to college, it was where. My grandfather, called him pop -Pop, was a Navy captain and a fighter pilot and the hero of my life. And he was the patriarch and he raised my mom and her brother and two sisters. And they instilled in me values that I carry to this day. And that's the way we see things. But my life changed because I started being introduced to, to a culture that I had never been raised in. You see my family, uh, think about it. My parents' generation they were raised by what some call the greatest generation, which was the World War II generation that stood up and fought for this country. And there were parades that celebrated the military. And I grew up having a real respect for my grandfather and a real respect for the party that my family chose. But that definitely influenced my mind. And really the stories I was told became my stories. I told those stories, they became beliefs. And now we call it a perspective, a viewpoint, a lens through which I see all of these things. I was raised in the upper middle class and really my part of the city was kind of the place to be. And then I went on and enjoyed everything that life had for me and I still kind of messed it up. Now I'm being challenged to pick a side but my side, I've got sides of this whole thing that I've grown very, very close to. Most of you know that have been following my work, I've done probably a hundred prisons and jails across America and on four continents. For a decade, I worked inside of prisons and I learned to see the other, you know, the one that wasn't like me, that had a different story. And I found out that if you find or hear or learn or feel somebody's story, it's so hard to judge them. Judgment comes at a distance. You can't feel somebody on TV. It's easy to surround yourself with people that think like you and look like you and believe like you and worship like you and vote like you. That's easy. It's easy to love those who love us. It's easy to agree with those and group up with those that see things just like us. But I was thrown into this world that I did not know. And I found out that the things I would believed about these, these men behind the razor wire it wasn't true. It was just as dangerous and violent, but there were heroes in there, men that are better men than me. And they changed me, they impacted me, and they helped me to see once you know somebody's story, it's hard to hate them. Hate happens at a distance. I was embraced by the NAACP and became a partner with them 
received an award from them, which was one of the greatest, sacred, most honorable things that had ever been done for me as I was embraced by the organization that's all about Dr. King. And Dr. King's one of my all-time heroes. I've been working in schools, and so I started to learn about the youth culture and started to see the young people. Today, we've got so many opinions about this young generation, and I get to spend lots of time with them. I see them. I poll them. I listen to them. I learn from them. I let them teach me because I don't know what it feels like to be 21 in 2020 and see through their eyeballs and feel with their heart and see what they believe because they're a different generation than ours. You know, I've been blessed to be the minority in my work for my whole career. I was able to pastor black churches and I loved it. I learned so much and I got to where, man, that's a style that I really, really love in my worship experience. I got to be embraced by the African-American culture as I worked with minorities and in prisons and inner city schools and youth gang intervention. And I got to be absorbed and embraced by this beautiful community that many of our white brothers and sisters have never really experienced the beauty of it, the culture of it, the things that that beautiful culture has that we need so bad. And it changed me. But I've also been adopted and partnered with law enforcement for years now. I've got probably six or eight police chiefs that I count as friends and brothers, and I worship with some of them. And they're dear friends and family to me. I've gotten an award from law enforcement, and that was a sacred honor. And I treasure it just like I treasured the other one. And this is my family. I grew up on the right, but I was embraced by the left. And so as much as I can be in the middle politically, <laughs> I, I choose issues and I choose individuals, not just party lines and group up with people that see things like me. I work with pastors, and I was in that field 15 years. I led churches, so I understand pastors. We still worship together, and I count them as friends. I'm partnered with judges right now. I'm partnered with a wonderful judge in the juvenile courts, working with youth gang intervention and giving kids a second chance. So if you can see when somebody says, pick a side, what side am I going to pick? Man, I'll pick an issue. I'll pick a conviction. I'll pick an opinion, but guess what? Today, you can change my mind. And does that mean I've got no conviction? I've got some beautiful brothers that are respectfully calling me out, saying, bro, take a stand, use your voice. You lack conviction. Do I lack conviction? Do you see me? I'm trying to see you. So today, raised on the right and embraced by the left and in here in the beautiful middle, but what it allows me to do is do three things. I see you, I feel you, and I get you. This is something that I worked on and practiced in prisons across America, because I don't know if I don't go, and if I don't look you in the eye face to face, feel your energy and say, please help me understand. That's how I've connected with beautiful black Muslims in the prison system, which is a powerful group, by saying, teach me. Let me walk with you. Teach me about Islam. Teach me something I might not know. And then we're in a conversation. We become friends. I see you. I feel you. I get you. This is my practice. Today, I want to tell you three stories from my life. And again, this is just my experience. If you happen to be a brother or sister of less color and you're watching this, don't get it twisted and think that I think you ought to believe like me. Man, you got to figure out your own journey on this thing. I'm just going to try to share some things that maybe give you a different viewpoint from a different angle. The first one is I see you. To me, that means respect. I learned to respect men that had not earned it yet. Men that were feared and hated and forgotten. Respect means I see you. I recognize your right to live your life the way that you want to live it. That's respect. You know, my first story comes out of a, a time of my life where I was riding with a beautiful brother named Gary Burke. He happens to be a brother of more color. He doesn't come from where I come from. He's short, I'm tall. He's black, I'm white. You know, I'm free world. He actually did some time. He's a beautiful returning citizen. Now he's a pastor of a church down in the the tough part of Atlanta, 
Lakewood Church of Hope. He's about this far away from getting his master's, no, excuse me, his doctorate in divinity. He'll be Dr. Gary Burke. But for three years, we rode the highways of America through the night, flying on planes, going into prisons, and building this thing that we call the Power Peace Project. And so these are the things that I learned. One night, we were coming back from a tour. We had been in New York City, Philadelphia, Jersey City. And we were coming back, man. We were high <laughs> on life, just on life. And we were talking and we were, I mean, it was amazing. We saw miracles and through the middle of the night, we're headed home and we're going way too fast. And we're going through Virginia. Now, <laughs> get the picture. We're in my car. It's all black. It's got black tinted windows. Me and Gary are wearing all black. <laughs> we didn't plan it that way, but we did. Gary loves to drive. And so he's driving through the night. We're talking. We're just kind of lost in conversation, not paying attention. All of a sudden, woo, right behind us. And I'm like, oh, Gary, what you doing to me, man? And so we pull over. Now, backstory. A few months before this, I was working with a significant gang leader. And he was in a very, very, it was a high profile case. Um, a gang-related murder case, a potential death penalty case. And I was working with him because we had become friends and I was trying to help him. And then I received a text because his gang, who had turned on him, did not like the fact that I was working with them. They sent me a threat. Now, if I told you the name of this gang, it's one that you know, and it's really considered one of the most dangerous gangs in America. And so I took that thing straight to the gang task force in my town. And I said, what do you want me to do with this? And they found out who it was from. And they said, we want you to do three things. We want you to learn how to take care of yourself. You know, take some martial arts. We want you to learn how to drive when you're being followed. If somebody turns three turns with you, punch it, call 911, and don't stop at red lights. And I'm like, really? And so, you know, I'm like, check. <laughs> What's number three? And they said, get a gun, learn how to use it, keep it on you. Now, this one was hard for me, you know, a peacemaker, strapped, <laughs> but I did it. And so I, I, I kept that in my glove compartment for a time. And so we're, we're driving through the middle of Virginia, middle of the night, black car, black windows, black outfits, black man driving, white man in the passenger seat with a gun in the glove compartment. Well, see, Gary's a convicted felon. He has absolutely changed his life, but he's got that thing that follows him around. He cannot be near a firearm, certainly not in the same car with one, certainly not two feet from him. And so I don't remember all this, and all of a sudden the officer gets out, comes around, state trooper, tap, tap, tap. I put down my window. He starts asking me questions. He wants my license. I told him, this is my car. He said, license, registration, proof of insurance. And then all of a sudden it hit me. I was like... Uh-oh, <laughs> I've got a gun in the glove compartment. And my brother here, this is a serious violation, like go to jail violation. And so I said, uh, sir, I don't know where it is, <laughs> which was a lie. And so I said, I don't know where it is. And he said, maybe it's in the glove compartment. I said, no, it's not in there. It might be in the trunk. You want me to check? He said, no, I want you to look in there. And so I opened it up and there it was, <laughs> this nine millimeter. And all of a sudden, whoa, it was high alert. And he backs off, calls in back up. Another state trooper, three would come. Actually, a total of three. And now we're in the middle of the night. It's cold. He gets us out of the car. We're on the back of the car, me and Gary. And I look over him and I said, bro, I am so sorry that I got us arrested tonight. And he said, brother, you didn't get us arrested. You got me arrested. And I was heartbroken. So we're in the back of this car. And so the trooper comes over and he looks at Gary and he says, Sir, do you know that you're a convicted felon? <laughs> it's like Gary's like, oh yeah, it's hard to forget. He said, do you know that you're not allowed to be in the possession or near a firearm? He said, yes, sir, I do. And he said, did you know that was in the glove compartment? And he said, no, that's what he said. And so he goes back and confers and we're sitting there and I'm like, Gary, I'm so sorry, bro. And he's just cool as ice. See, he's been in this situation before. Now, I've been in situations, I was a knucklehead. I got locked up a few times when I was young, being stupid. But now it's my friend. He came back around, put me back in the car, rolled down the window, said, tell me a story, short one, what happened? I said, I work with gangs, we work in prisons, we're on a tour, I've got an active threat. The officers told me to get a gun, I'm new at this, it's with him, it's not his fault. All right, the next thing that happens blows my mind. 
He said, show me credentials and I show it. He gives it back, gives my license back and says, listen, put that thing in the glove. I mean, in the, in the trunk, lock it down. Don't touch it again. Go to Atlanta. And don't ever do this again. And then he stuck his white hand into my car and he shook my hand and he said, thank you for what you're doing. Keep up the good work. And they got in their cars and they went away. I looked at Gary and I said, man, we dodged a bullet today, bro. And he said, nah, I got me a white boy. And I saw it. It was the first time that I had actually seen it, right? I mean, I had witnessed the issue. Now, it wasn't close to home yet, but my friend had just gotten out of going to jail because he was with a brother of less color. Now, you might say, no, nah, it was just this or that. No, I'm telling you. Gary told me two days ago, he said, bro, you realize if you weren't in the car with me, I'd still be in jail. And so I saw the influence that I could have as a white male in this country that favors me. So I see you. Today, can you see the other? I started seeing this white privilege thing, but it didn't ha hit close to home yet. But Gary knew it. I recognize the right for you to live your life. Today, respect says, I recognize the right for you to live your life. I don't have the right to judge you because I don't know your journey. I don't know who raised you. I don't know your worst day. I don't know your dreams and heartaches. I don't know if you were treated a certain way when you were young, heaven forbid, abused, or if you've been, I don't know your background. So why would I think I know? Just because you wear a label that says Democrat, liberal, blue, Black Lives Matter, I meant blue politically. How can I look at that label and think I know you? Everybody's got a good reason for what they believe. Some are willing to die for it. I'm one of those. Maybe you are too. So today I recognize your right to live how you believe you should live. Number two, I feel you. This is hard. This is the thing that I think is the medicine to get this conversation started is I feel you. This is when Dr. King marched people into Birmingham, hoses, rocks, bottles. It was so ugly seeing people beat down and the white America saw it on TV for the first time and for a little bit they said, I feel you. That's why Gandhi taught nonviolence. That's why Dr. King adopted that and made it his own. That's why Mandela studied Gandhi. When we suffer nonviolently, we arouse the conscience of the spectators. And they start to feel the one who's being abused. When we raise a violent hand, we strengthen the other side and make them feel justified in beating us down. That's how it's always worked. Jesus, the champion of nonviolence. He was treated unfairly, and yet he bore our burdens so that we would feel him. So the second story is close to home. I went through a really bad time. I turned 40 and the wheels fell off. And I'd been in the ministry for a long time. I got out and the old me came roaring back. And I had a couple years where I was in the wilderness. And I was at my darkest point. All my dreams had been crashed, and I was a cautionary tale. People were talking about me in Atlanta. I know a lot of people in Atlanta, they know me. And all of a sudden, man, did you hear about Kit? He fell out. All kind of rumors swirling around. I was dark, and I just didn't even that much want to be here anymore. One night late, I was coming back from a place that I shouldn't have been. And I'm driving home in a condition that respectfully, and I apologize, I drove this way for a many, many times. And I don't know why my story turned out like it did, but I know what happened this night. I get all the way up the road and I almost get home, long drive, and then I just pass out. And my car veers off and, and flies into a guardrail, a guardrail that saved my life because on the other side was nothing but ravine and oak trees. If I pass out one second earlier, I'm not here. One second later, I'm not here, but I crashed where I crashed because God is in the details and he saved my life with that guard. He guarded my life that night. So I'm out on the street. It's three o'clock in the morning. I'm confused. My car's crashed and all of a sudden, whoo, the blue lights. Officer pulls up, gets me off the road, asks me for my license, and then 
the unbelievable happens. He takes me, he puts me in the front seat with no cuffs, <laughs> right by the computer, as far as I know. And then we drive away. And you might be like, man, what'd y'all talk about? I have no clue because I passed out in his front seat. Now think about that. So I'm out of it. We're driving in a police car. I'm in the front seat. That's not good police work. And so we get all the way to where we're going. Next thing I know, I'm being gently woken up and I'm at my house and he lets me go. He doesn't even write me a ticket. And then he calls a tow company and gets my car towed to the collision shop. They call me the next day and say, hey, we got your car. An officer called it in last night. And it changed my life. Okay, now I'm in the sudden note. You talk about white privilege? I mean, my buddy didn't go to jail because I happened to be in the car and I got a handshake from an officer. Now you can try to, I mean, again, this is just me. You can believe whatever you believe. And if this is not your experience, man, hold to your conviction, but maybe consider mine. And so <laughs> I don't know how to explain that. Oh, I feel like I should apologize to my brothers and sisters of color because I live in a country where that saved me, man. Do you know if I go to jail that night, maybe I go so dark that I'm not here anymore. Do you feel me? See, the second one is, I feel you. Now, all of a sudden, I'm not just seeing Gary get treated in a country that favors me. But now, I'm in a situation where, man, my life should have been jacked up. That night, I should have gone to jail. It was terrible police work to let me go and go in my house. What if I do something bad? But it didn't work out that way. It blessed me. And I got one more shot. And I got sober. I ain't been thirsty in 15 years. God. He gave me another shot. But there's so many beautiful brothers and sisters of more color that are watching that, and maybe you're getting a little bit more mad, and I'm okay with that. Man, I, I'm not ashamed that this is my story. I don't care how this looks because white privilege is all over Fox News or CNN. This is my story, and I get to tell it from what I believe. Stories create our lives, and I, I look back and started seeing these fingerprints of grace and mercy in the, in the land of the free. And so then when I see people getting arrested, I see it differently because now I look at my brother Gary and I say, as much as I can, I feel you, bro, because there's no way he didn't go to jail that night if he was me. Can you imagine any brother or sister of color? Being in that situation, either one of them, a gun in the car with a felon crashing and a blackout drunk, and yet I skate once again. I appreciate the fact that I get that kind of privilege, but I'm not going to deny it. And I feel like I've got a responsibility because if I am afforded that privilege, what if I don't speak up for it? Or what if I say, man, white privilege, who do you think you are? And I try to deconstruct somebody's feeling. That's why I'm sharing these personal stories, because it's hard to argue with somebody's experience. It's hard to debate somebody's heart. We debate here. Racism is learned. It's taught. It's modeled. It is not natural. No baby comes into the world a racist, a bigot, a hater. We learn that. We see it modeled by adults. We hear it around the, the breakfast table. We talk about it in schools. We see the news. This young generation, they have grown up on the news. They know more than we ever did back in 1975. Man, can you feel the other today? Can you care enough to ask, what is your story, brother? People of my color need to start inviting people in or invite ourselves over and start to tell stories, not just shout convictions, but tell stories. Jesus told stories and he asked questions. And people, they convicted themselves. They self-discovered the truth because it was good questions. It was listening. And then let me tell you a story. And Jesus walked with the other. Walk a mile, walk two miles and have a conversation, especially with people who look like you. Is it going to be comfortable? No. Who cares? That's how things change. Any good change is not comfortable. Break, break your body down and build it up again. There's pain. Man, we got to heal some relationships. I feel you as compassion. I'm asking my brothers and sisters of less color to practice compassion and listen today. And the more angry the person is, listen more. The more hurt they are, listen more. 
The more confused you are, ask more questions. Maybe shut up and just feel them. Compassion means I feel your pain. I see you as I respect you. You don't have to earn my respect. I'm going to lead with respect. I did that in prison. So one, for self-preservation. I wasn't going to try to disrespect a brother white in a blue stripe because I work with gang leaders. And I've seen gang leaders come together, and I have to say this. Man, not just in one prison, in dozens of prisons where we've started these peace movements, I've seen black militant Muslim brothers break bread and embrace literally white Aryan Brotherhood Nazi leaders in a prison environment. And I'm talking about Nazi across the head and a strong black brother, both leaders embracing in front of all the peers in that room, dangerous rivals. And I heard them stand and cheer. These men hated, feared, and forgotten are doing things that some of us in the free world are not doing. Can you feel the other? Can you feel the officer? Can you feel the young person that's getting caught up in the emotion? Can you feel Black Lives Matter? Can you feel the pastor? Can you feel the mother of the gangster? Can you feel the other? Can you become the other? That's the answer. The last one is... I get you. See, if I see you and I respect your right to live and believe and feel, I can't tell you how to feel, but I can respect you. But see, I get you means empathy. See, empathy is the powerful thing. Sympathy is I feel bad for you. Compassion is, man, I feel your pain. I don't know what it feels like, but I hurt because you hurt. But empathy, man, is like I've walked that road for a minute and I feel you. The last story, it's my, this one hits close. This is empathy. My daughter, who's the light of my life, she's 21, and she's a dreamer, she's a free spirit, and she's a soldier. She believes what she believes. She's out on the West Coast right now, and out in the Pacific Northwest where there's a lot of things going on. And it's been scary for me because <laughs> I raised her to be a freedom fighter. And now she's going out and finding her voice. And I'm like, baby, don't go. Like, I want everybody else to rise up, but not mine. Why? Because it scares me. And when something scares me, I get mad. I mean, that's what fear does. If I'm ever mad, ask me what I'm afraid of. Well, here, my daughter is in harm's way, but if you've seen those, those students arm in arm between the protesters and the police, and those, those, a lot of them happen to be brothers and sisters young of less color, and I was inspired when I saw that, and I shared it on Facebook, and I said, look at this young generation, peacemakers, that looks like King right there, but now it's mine. And I was talking to Gary two days ago. He's my confidant, my brother. He's my consigliere. Why? Because he's walked a mile I don't know. And I said, bro, I'm scared, man. And he said, you just got to go ahead and trust. Just trust. Give it to God. You can't control it. She'll be all right. She'll reach out. And I saw the coolness about him. And I saw not just his conviction, but his peace. And then a thought shook me. As I was on the phone, I said, my God, Gary, I just had a thought. It was an epiphany. I said, the way I feel about my daughter right now in these protests is how people that look like you feel every day about their kids. I can't imagine my whole life waking up saying, man, where's my little girl? I'm afraid. Please, something don't happen to her today. You better believe every morning I'm saying, please, God, protect her today. Man, she's got a good head on her shoulders. But this thing, there's a lot of things that we can't control. And all of a sudden, it shook me. I said, man, this is how my brothers and sisters of more color are trying to help me understand that they have felt their whole life. And all of a sudden, boom, it was a little bit of empathy. Now, I get Gary. You see, I saw Gary and that night with the state patrol. I felt Gary that night when I should have been the one going to jail, but now I get Gary just a little bit. And my brothers and sisters of color, more color than me, beautiful color. Man, I feel you. Now I, I'm starting to feel a little bit of the pain. 
Now multiply it times your whole life. I can't feel that. Today, please don't dig in so hard. Try to see the other. Man, open your ears and try to feel the other. Man, open your heart and try to get the other. Because if I see you, I respect you. If I feel you, I have compassion. But man, if I get you, it means I've walked a mile with you. I won't pick a side. Man, I'll stand with my brothers and sisters of more color. The NAACP has been very good to me. And they've invited me in to Juneteenth and have a part of that thing. Why would I say no? That's my fam. But man, my police officers and my, my chiefs and lieutenants and sheriffs, man, they've, they've embraced me and they're inviting me in to have a voice. And so I'm trying to use my voice there too. I was raised on the conservative right. I was embraced by the left. I ain't choosing a side. Man, I'm going to choose all sides. And then maybe I can be a voice. We need unifiers today, not just loud shouts. Now, if you got to shout, shout. If you got to march, march. Please don't hurt anything or anybody, but you use your voice. I got no right to tell you how to march, but I'm going to tell you, see the other today. Hopefully feel them, and hopefully we can become one another. We can fix this thing. If it takes a long time, it takes a long time. If it's hard, of course it's hard. Man, we walked a long way to get ourselves into this mess. Now it's time to turn around and walk out. I'm praying for God to do a miracle today. I'm praying that God... We'll protect you today and especially our children they're watching if this helps anybody share it man let's start the conversation but please don't say something you can never take back use facebook to encourage not to tear down i love you i see you i feel you i'm trying to get you in god's name amen be the peace you wish to see in the world